Uh, today is the 14th of September 2006. We're in Mizano Adriatico, etc., with John Milton from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, John, can you just first tell us a little bit about the research that you've been doing in translation studies in, in recent years? Okay. The project which I published a book on was about the Clube do Livro, a Brazilian book club, probably the first ever book club in Brazil which began in 1942 and finally finished, was closed down finally in 1989. Now this book club, together with uh, original works in Portuguese, published a large number of translations from, originally more from French at the beginning, and then uh, moved to English. These translations of classic fiction were often cut in order to fit a fixed number of pages, 160, uh, all the books had 160 pages in order to cut, cut costs. Uh, a book in order to fit 160 pages would either be cut or published in two volumes, one one month, one the month after. Now, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as fitting 160 pages, these books were also censored or doctored, we could say. Certain elements were taken out, elements which mentioned sex, elements uh, uh, which had... Uh, scatological, they mention bodily functions, elements which had a political content in certain periods were cut out. For example, the translation of uh, Silas Marner, the nobles live in a mansion in a house called the Red House. How was the Red House translated into Portuguese in 1969, which was uh, just after the coup within the military dictatorship when a hardline government took over. Well, how was the Red House translated into Portuguese? A Casa Amarela, the Yellow House. Obviously, this seems a little bit silly in some ways, but red was a dangerous color in 1969 in Brazil. Uh, other elements that were cut out were, uh, as well as political elements, as well as scatological and sexual elements, uh, where references to certain nationalities. When in Charlotte Bronte's The Professor, the central character who's a teacher, a male teacher based on Charlotte Bronte herself, who goes to Belgium and uh, is rather insulting towards the Flemish, uh, calling them almost, uh, uh, almost uncivilized, uh, almost uh, of being useless, of having a kind of uh, being mentally handicapped almost. And I first gave this presentation when José Lambert, who's Flemish, was, uh, was the, the, uh, in charge of the presentation. Uh, these elements are cut by the book club. They cut sexual elements, they cut scatological elements, they cut political references, stylistically as well, when there's a little bit of poetry or something from another language, cut. Uh, and so the original, sorry, the translation we get, in some cases, for example, that of Rabelais' Gargantua, uh, has a lot, the translation has a lot of things missing when we compare it to the original. Now, if we were going to make a value judgment about these translations, we must consider them poor. But the Clube do Livro was selling its books through agents to people who were not used to buying books. It had people going door to door, asking them if they would like to join the book club, selling the books very cheaply, uh, because the books were based on a uh, what I call a, fa a factory system, an assembly line system. Like, uh, where a certain number of books were published, all of which would be sold. They would not be occupying shelf space. And so these books could be sold very, very cheaply. And the target audience was kind of very lower middle class or working class. Uh, a lot of the readers were actually teenagers. I've met a number of uh, people, some of them colleagues of mine, who a number of years ago would spend their pocket money on these books. So, on one hand, we can say that the books were low-quality translations, these books of the Clube du Livre. On the other hand, we can say 
that, yes, they might be bad quality, but they did manage to introduce literature, although in some cases it didn't exactly reflect the original, to people who were not used to reading literature. So my conclusion of this study overall was quite positive. Okay. Uh, what about in Brazil? You, because it's not just you now. Um, there are quite a few people working in translation studies. Is, is there um, a Brazilian perspective or set of theories or preferences at all? Well, I go around to congresses and talking to people and sending emails saying that what a number of people take as the Brazilian perspective is not quite true, not quite right, not quite correct even. It's very interesting that uh, people come up to me and they say, oh, you work in translation in Brazil, are you a cannibal? Are you from the cannibalistic school? And I have to correct them. I say, no, this is not quite the thing. A number of people, uh, because they've read Edwin Gensler, uh, contemporary translation theories, because they've read Maria Timoshko, because they've read Mona Baker, because they've read Susan Bassnett, who have all uh, uh, publicized the, the, the uh, work that Arudo and Augusto de Campos have done on translation, which I think they got from each other and originally from an article by a Brazilian uh, translation theoretician, Elsie Vieira, in which she mentions the so-called cannibalistic theories of the uh, Campos brothers Augusto and Arudo. It seemed that this particular article was taken up by a large number of other people. In fact, although the Campos brothers talk about anthropophagy, the idea of Mario de Andrade, a Brazilian modernist poet and critic who writing in the 1920s said that all Brazilian literature is based on other literatures. Brazil, like the Brazilian Indian, will uh, kill the enemy, eat the enemy, and be nourished by the powers of the enemy, they in fact never called themselves writers of the cannibalistic school. This was a term which was taken up or, or invented even by Elsie Vieira and has been taken up by other people. It's interesting to see how this particular idea got around. So it, it's used more outside of Brazil than inside of Brazil? Haroldo de Campos Augusto de Campos are never called cannibalistic translators in Brazil. They have used the term recreation on many terms. They have used the term anthropophagy. Uh, they have never used the term cannibalism or called themselves cannibalistic tra translators. When I'm asked if I'm a cannibal or if I belong to the school of cannibalism, I uh, say what I've said, more or less what I've said just now. Okay. Um, you're not Brazilian, you're from England. When, going back when you were 22, 23, 24, what were you doing? How did you get from Birmingham to Sao Paulo? Well, uh, I took Spanish at university, the University of Wales, uh, in, in that uh, as part of my course, I took what they what they call you called at that time an intercalary year. I think they say a year abroad. I don't think they use that term now. And then, when I finished my course, I went to Brazil to practice my Spanish. <laughs> and then, after three months, I found it was Portuguese and not Spanish. I thought it was just a different dialect. <laughs> How did you get into translation studies then? I think by accident, like most of us, by accident, my MA was written on Shakespeare. On a kind of, I did an MA in Applied Linguistics at the Catholic University of Sao Paulo. It was on a syntactic analysis of Shakespearean plays on what they call the periphrastic do. Shakespeare, uh, intro at the time Shakespeare wrote, the do form of questions and negatives, dost thou love me, existed together with the old form, lovest thou me. I quite enjoyed the study, but I wasn't quite sure where it was going after that. And then my supervisor for my MA said, oh, uh, why don't you think about working in the area of translation? I said, oh, that's a good idea. And I began doing so, okay. bit by chance. Okay. How did you get in touch with, with the translation studies? Because what years are we talking about? 
Uh, we're talking about the 1980s, the mid-1980s, the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. I think it was a way out of the linguistic model. Uh, at the time of the writing the MA dissertation, in fact, I didn't actually take a course in translation, which I could have done. It was an optional course. I wasn't too attracted of the little I knew about Newmark, Nida, uh, and Catford. And I think it opened, descriptive translation studies opened up a new area. Uh, we, didn't, we no longer had to make just purely linguistic analysis. We could look at elements which had always interested me, the history of cultures, history of literatures, comparing one translation on another and another. Perhaps uh, a much open, much wider view. I think that's the initial thing that interested me. And as I said, I think Lefebvre's work, uh, the idea of refraction, that translation was, uh, could also be uh, a film, uh, uh, a, a critical work, uh, nowadays, of course, a website. That, I think, was the main inspiration uh, for the book I did on the Club du Livre, which, as I said, looked at the way in which translations had been condensed, cut, to fit 160 pages in the Club du Livre book format. Uh, these days, you're chair of the Translation Committee within the International Comparative Literature Association. You've been there for some time now. Uh, how is that working? What are the relations between translation studies and comparative literature uh, within that context? Okay, what does comparative literature include? The Brazilian Comparative Literature Association, Abralik, includes just about everything. I think, as I, I briefly mentioned, uh, the critic and poet Oswald de Andrade said Brazilian literature will always be comparative, there will always be this element. Comparative literature has this big problem now of defining itself. What is included? Should, cer should certain things be cut out? Should translation be part of it? Should it not be part of it? I think this has been a there has actually been a discussion within the Comparative Literature Association uh, on the actual place of translation. Should it be included? Should it not be, should it not be included? It seems, however, now that uh, it does have a definite place within comparative literature. Uh, the work of descriptive translation studies was originally based in comparative literature and uh, Lieven Dulst, José Lambert, for a long time, or Lieven still is, very active members of the International Comparative Literature Association. Yes, we have the Congress in Brazil next year. I'm sure there'll be a lot in the area of translation studies. But no, I, I think on the, on the other hand, I, although a lot of the work I do is in the area of literary studies, this is not, I, I, I don't like to see translation confined to this area. There's a tendency to use the term translation to cover such things as immigration, movement of people, hybrid cultural forms of all kinds, going beyond a traditional interlingual concept of translation. Do you go along with that extended use of the term? I think we must fix some kind of boundary somewhere, and I would say no, I would prefer to work just with the interlingual point of view. Although it's very, very difficult to fix the boundary somewhere. Is everything translation? When we, th we have an idea, we put that idea into words. Is that translation? I think in order to define some kind of discipline, to give us some kind of fixed boundaries, I think we need just to stop somewhere. What, what kind of research do you think is needed in translation? If you were starting out as a researcher now, what kind of topics would you be taking on? One of the areas I would like to work in, or perhaps I, I would like to see people working in, is exactly what happens in the publishing world, exactly what happens within the company, exactly what happens today we've been uh, 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 having a lecture from Yves Gombier, exactly what happens within the film company, the video company. Uh, perhaps even I can learn something from my son, uh, who Anthony knows a little bit, I think he knew him a little bit, who's just started working within a media company, who 
uh, are responsible for uh, transmitting and sending our digital television uh, work on uh, festivals of commercial films right around the world. Perhaps I can even work with Thomas to find out what happens in the language transfer within that particular company. What emphasis do they give to it? A lot? Little? Nothing? Do they contract the work out? Do they get somebody within the company to do it? Who's in charge of making the decisions? Who corrects? Who revises? What if there are problems? What if people are dissatisfied? Uh, this is the kind of thing I would like to see people working more on. And I think it's, a, it's an area in which very, very little has been done. It's very difficult, for example. It's, uh, it, it, it's not the study where you can just get a book or, as people do, uh, uh, two copies of a, a number of copies of a uh, subtitled film. It's work which needs, uh, uh, it's a study which needs enormous amount of field work which will at times be difficult to see exactly what goes on within the companies, within the publishing house. Perhaps this is uh, connected in some ways to a, a, field which, a, a field which in the area of translation studies, I think it's worth, ex worth exploring, uh, actor network theory, to see how, to see the roles, the decisions made by the individual players, the actors in the decision process. What happens within this area of translation studies? Okay, John, thanks very much. Thank you.